All right, so I want to share as a way of kind of wrapping up um, our starting thoughts on feminist art with a story from The Flaming Apron. The Flaming Apron was a craft store that ran for less than a year in Montreal in the early 70s. It was a not-for-profit that tried to be as removed from competitive norms and aesthetic conventions of the commercial art world as possible. Their policy was to accept handmade items of any woman who wished to sell them, helping women to see their work as aesthetically valuable without fear of rejection or judgment. This story was related by one of the collective's members, Billy Joe Brewey. One day, a woman came into the flaming apron. She walked around the store, looking at everything, and then, looking at some crocheted doilies which were displayed on the wall, she said, Do you ever tell the women what to make? I answered, Of course not, thinking she was probably surprised at the high quality of the work she was seeing. But she was having just the opposite reaction. It looks like a church bazaar, all pastel colors, little doilies and doodads, no awareness of new design ideas or color, very traditional, no experimentation, etc., etc. She was shaking and obviously very upset by this experience. She said she was shocked by what she had seen and said that she was angry that the store had such poor examples of women's art. It's no wonder that women artists aren't taken seriously. I wanted her to understand what the store was trying to do. I told her that women have been told what to do for too long and that we are trying to find our way back to our own creativity. I explained that we would not tell a woman what to make or infringe on her right to work as she pleased. We had decided that in making the store, we would not set ourselves up as judges of taste or quality." End quote. In this short story, we see such powerful currents and countercurrents to feminist efforts to promote and value women's work, and the emotions that come to the surface in the process. On the one hand, we could criticize the woman who came into the store for applying aesthetic criteria from the male-dominated artwork to the work she saw. She wanted to see art by women that was great in the way that art made by men is seen to be and evaluated to be great. She wanted confirmation that women can produce works just like that, at the same level of air experimentation and formal design principles. We might think that this is holding women artists to a standard that is steeped in patriarchal and sexist thinking about artistic genius and what makes artistic achievements great. At the same time, we can appreciate her criticism that the work she saw was simply repeating the style, techniques, and design choices that women have been traditionally relegated to. Doilies, pastel colors, doodads. One can almost see the array of objects before her. Can't you? I can. And I, at least, understand her rage. But then again, one really appreciates Brewery's response that the aim of the shop was to give creative control back to women not hem them in to a certain idea of what makes art great and valuable. If they chose to make more doilies, so be it. <laughs> the end line is very telling. The shop, the space within which objects are being presented as valuable, would not itself make any value judgments about the relative quality of the work within its walls. As far as the flaming apron was concerned, it was all the same quality, or rather the issue of quality was simply not one to be asked and answered. We want to think, what is the underlying assumption here? Is it that the possibility of having the quality of one's work judged would itself discourage women from pursuing creative self-expression, regardless of the criteria used in the judgment? Maybe it was kind of a practical stance to try to encourage women to actually submit their work and produce work. Or we might think that the underlying assumption is that they should not judge the quality of the work because to do so would employ male-oriented art world criteria with the further underlying assumption that these are the only criteria available or possible. Either you're assessing the value, the relative value of artworks using criteria steeped in a patriarchal history, or you're not doing that at all. Um, we want to think, is the underlying assumption here that those are the only two options? When I was looking for a feminist response to the idea that the value of art is autonomous from practical and political concerns, I found several papers from the 80s and 90s that address this kind of attitude. The Flaming Apron gives us a concrete example of it. In turning away from the male-oriented tradition of the art world, the assumption was that one couldn't or shouldn't assess the relative aesthetic quality of art made by women. In the paper from Musgrave I originally had on the syllabus, she argues that this is an approach inspired by liberal feminist politics, 
a kind of representation-only approach to equality that takes attention away from the artwork itself and places it on the artist. It doesn't matter what women produce, the doily itself, or how it looks or feels, its formal qualities, etc., none of that really matter. All that matters for the value bestowed upon it by the flaming apron is that it was made by a woman. There's something refreshing about this that I want to emphasize. On the one hand, there's a kind of joyful generosity to it, a kind of throwing open the shutters of aesthetic criteria that keeps some things out of view as unworthy of our attention or admiration, and welcoming everything in. There's a kind of abundance to it, a proliferating sort of enjoyment, even in the doilies, <laughs> the doilies too. <laughs> but on the other hand, there can be something sort of trivializing about it, or kind of deadening. We can take in and enjoy everything offered without asking about its relative value compared to other works, but it also means that we can't recognize the specially beautiful or artistically vibrant works that do come along, that are more inspired than others. Uh, we have no ability to contrast those works with ones that do strike us as being a bit uninspired or repetitive or just plain bad. Um, we can probably all conjure up bad artworks we've seen where we're just sort of standing there trying to find them interesting. Valuing everything the same, fail or, or trying not to make uh, relative judgments of value, seems to fail to account for a very real part of our response to objects in the world and appreciation for their aesthetic and artistic properties. Um, Okay, so feminist philosophers like Christine Battersby have pointed out that we seem to face a few different options when we think about aesthetically evaluating work by women artists. And these map on to the three possible answers we could give to the question, why have there been no great women artists that I started off with? So those are, number one, the first option is to apply to women's art the same aesthetic criteria that have been articulated in response to and have helped establish the ascendancy of art made by men. Some women artists will make the cut, but nothing about our standards will change. The second option is to refuse to apply traditional aesthetic criteria to art made by women, and along with it, refuse the whole idea of making evaluative judgments about the aesthetic merit of artworks. We can carry on with art historical projects that look at the social and material conditions for the production of artworks and consider their social and political impact. But we can no longer talk about what makes one artwork specifically aesthetically better than another, or more valuable than another. We cannot talk about this dimension of our experience at all. Or three, the third option, uh, we could refuse to apply traditional aesthetic criteria to art made by women, and instead apply some other kind of aesthetic criteria. Maybe we can reinvent the aesthetic criteria that we're working with, or um, reform them in some way that can better address a proliferation and a, and a generous attention to all different kinds of objects. Maybe there is aesthetic language for that, and we might describe this as feminist aesthetic criteria of some kind. What will this look like? That's the big question, and that's the exciting one. Kind of combine the um, abundance of generous attention that the flaming apron represents with a recognition of um, how incredibly striking and inspiring certain objects will be and that others others might not be <laughs> okay all right thanks